I mean, obviously he's a fan of Sherlock Holmes, or at least Arthur Conan Doyle. Mm-hmm. Is there anyone who likes Arthur Conan Doyle outside of Sherlock Holmes? <laughs> That's a <laughs> like, great question. I like Arthur Conan Doyle, but I fucking hate Sherlock. <laughs> <laughs> he's the worst. That would be pretty funny. I don't. I can't even think of anything else that he wrote. Okay, other works. Yeah, his works include fantasy and science fiction stories about Professor Challenger, a humorous stories about the Napoleonic soldier Brigadier Gerard, as well as plays, romances, poetry, nonfiction, and historical novels. Sounds boring. Hello and welcome to It's the Greatest Show, Man, the show where we talk about the musicals you love and why they're great and why they suck. I'm your host, Brandon Wheeler, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Emily Chavone. Hello. How are you today? I'm doing fine. I was better uh-huh. before I prepared for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was just thinking as I was uh, getting to my recording spot that I was like, you know, we had we had a lot of fun talking about Little Mermaid. This is not going to be that. <laughs> I Yeah, I was thinking that too. I, I was trying to find things to write down and for my talking points because, as you know, I like to take a lot of notes. Oh, yeah. And I was thinking, yeah. you know, we but we talked about The Little Mermaid for probably three hours. We actually talked about the show. And then there was an additional hour of us just talking, which is pretty normal right. for us. Yeah. yeah. And this one, I was like, this might be our shortest episode. <laughs> it might. I mean, partially because there's not a ton about this show. Well, um, and but also I because think, there's other there's reasons. reasons for that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's fair enough. Anyway. So, uh Today we're doing something a little different. We're talking about a show that neither of us had really seen before and is not very well known or recognized, and that is the surprisingly Sherlock Holmes-based musical, Baker Street. Uh, yeah, and I remember one thing. That, what is it that you said to me the one, when I when I pitched that doing this show was that Sherlock Holmes Sherlock Holmes is a character that shouldn't sing. Yeah, I just I still don't <laughs> buy him as a singing character. Sure, I I get that, you know, and like now having seen this, I also kind of agree. <laughs> <laughs> we we talked about a little a little about this before we started recording, but mm-hmm. neither of us are super Sherlock Holmes fans. No, not really. I mean, I have I've seen I've, I've watched Sherlock with Benedict Cumberbatch, and I like the Robert Downey Jr. movies, but like I've never actually read a book a Sherlock Holmes book before. I have. I mm-hmm. had to read. The Hound of the Baskervilles for an English class in high school. Okay. And I remember hating it. <laughs> <laughs> and I I don't think I've seen the Robert Downey Jr. Like, maybe I've seen parts of it. This, mm-hmm. this is normal for me. If it's film, I haven't seen it. Or I fell asleep while I was watching it. <laughs> I think maybe my husband and I watched quotes, watched Sherlock Holmes, the Sherlock show or parts mm-hmm. of it. Uh, and by we watched it, I mean he watched it and I fell asleep on the couch. Right. <laughs> I'm aware of the character and kind of the persona that comes with it. And I, mm-hmm. nothing about that says musical theater to me. <laughs> you know, yeah. And, you know, maybe that's for a reason. <laughs> I, I think there are some pretty good reasons. Okay. But we'll, well get to it. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll get to it. All right. So let's just uh, to give a little bit of background on this show. Okay. So Baker Street was first produced um, in 1965 by uh, the book is by Jerome Cooper Smith and the music and lyrics by Marion Grudeff and Raymond Jessel. Obviously based on the stories, loosely based, I'll say pretty loosely based on the uh, Sherlock Holmes stories by Arthur Conan Doyle or sorry, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And by loosely, it's very it's very loosely, uh, roughly three different Sherlock Holmes stories in this one show, uh, which is three too many. <laughs> uh, personally, like, if they're going to do Sherlock like, the that's the thing I feel like with Sherlock Holmes. It's just so dense. You really need to kind of focus on, like, one if you're going to, or maybe a part of another. Um, but this one in particular is based off of the three stories, A Scandal in Bohemia, uh, The Final Problem, and The Empty House. Um, it's set in and around London in 1897, right when these stories are kind of written, um, which is the year that England celebrated the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria. It is mentioned in the musical, so I figured I probably should say that. The only like major difference between the, this musical, other than the fact that it's a musical, and the stories it's based on is that Irene Adler is, not, is in the show, but she's not really a antagonist she's more of like a love interest 
Mm-hmm. Um, which I think has happened in other Sherlock Holmes things before, but it feels very forced here specifically. Um, sure does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, just because, like, you know, Sherlock Holmes is one of those characters where he doesn't get that, and then and that is a, that is a, a theme that they explore a bit. You know, when they there's in one song in particular, they talk about how he doesn't understand love basically mm-hmm. and i read adler is essentially trying to like seduce him in a way but not but in a more playful way not in like a super sexual way i guess yeah i would say it's pretty it's pretty uh standard for musical theater at the time mm-hmm. to have this like lovey romantic leading lady right right for sure well i guess let's let's get into this um <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, I so I don't know. Should we start with this talking about the musical itself, or should we talk about the production team? Because there's a fun kind of some fun stories behind all that. Um, let's talk about the musical first. I think. Okay, let's talk about the and musical. We'll so, talk about all right. So, um, <laughs> one thing about this show that I mean, I noticed right away. Obviously, it's an older show. It's from '65. Uh, so it does have an overture, mm-hmm. and I feel like a lot of modern musicals don't have overtures anymore. Um, I can't really think of one that does. I'm trying to think of one because I feel like that can't be true. <laughs> but I, I think there is a tendency to just kind of jump in and let the opening mm-hmm. number do all the work. But we're also yeah. in an age where I assume most people go into a musical having heard the cast recording, especially where we are. Yeah. Like we're sure. not anywhere close to Broadway. Mm-hmm. So it's not like we can hear about a show and go in. Like there, in theory, there's been marketing and social media posting and then probably a cast album before most people or at least we would get a chance to experience it live right so a lot of the time i already have a pretty good idea of what it's going to sound like going into the theater so i don't hmm i'm trying to think of a recent show like a contemporary musical that has an overture i can't think of any well and the thing too is like it may be one of those things where it has an overture when you see it live but there's not an overture included on the soundtrack uh, on the cast recording yeah that makes yeah, sense yeah that might be a, a, the case too but i think the, a, a modern musical that just popped into my head i think could benefit from an overture is beetlejuice i was I just thinking does beetlejuice have an overture <laughs> i don't know if it does i don't think it does on the on the soundtrack sure does no the, no i think it starts with dead mom like a or something like that no really I Welcome to a show like, about like, death is the opening number. Uh, he, that's the like the big. There's one like a small number right before that. Really? Because like because he, he says uh, Beetlejuice is like a ballad already or whatever. Oh, that's right. I'm trying to think. Like, come from away jumps right in. Surely, Dear Evan Hansen has a overture. Oh, uh, sorry. It's, it's the Beetlejuice starts off with with Invisible. There's it's like there's a song that uh, everyone's favorite musical theater actor uh, Sophia Ann Caruso sings. Uh, invisible <laughs> she's visible and he goes uh i forget what the exact lines but he's like oh ballad already and the, yeah and, and that song and then he starts, sings the right. whole being dead thing you're right which is a great that's a great opening number well and hades town doesn't Mm-mm. the prom doesn't does mm-hmm. moulin rouge i don't think moulin rouge does either because it yeah, and when, evan hansen doesn't either really Hamil- hamilton doesn't have an overture i don't think evan hansen has an overture surely something like new york new york has an overture Oh, maybe one of those. Yeah, I haven't heard those. Like, I'm trying to think, what's this year? Shuck. I don't think Shuck does either. That makes me sad. As a musical theater person, like as a music person, Mm -hmm. I like a good overture. Yeah, I mean, and so do I, but... And as a performer, I like like, like getting pumped backstage when the overture's playing. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite things. For sure, yeah. (laughs) Anyway, uh, enough about our overture team. So anyway, there's an overture. There's an overture, but like the first song in the show comes like, I don't know, three, four minutes in, maybe even more than that. It's like the overture and then we get like a small scene that's got to be like five oh, yeah. minutes. And then we get to the first song in the show, which, you know, sets up Holmes as a character. But here's my thing. The first song in the show is, um, it's so simple, right? Yep. Uh, and he, so basically what I said was like, this may be the best song in the show, but I'm going to use that term pretty loosely. Um, just because out of context, the show, the song works fine. That's not necessarily like context for like, I mean, criteria for like a good musical theater song is that out of context, it can make sense. But like, even at that point, it's like you can take it out of context and it could work just fine. But 
even then, I'm like, it's not bad, and it sets up Holmes as a character, but considering he's one of the most like well-known characters in literature, I'm not as sure that's actually necessary. Uh, because like if you know Sherlock Holmes and you like if you're gonna go see this show and you are a fan of Sherlock Holmes, you know how he operates, right? His powers of deduction are like you know world renowned. He's got you know he. I don't know if this song is absolutely absolutely necessary. If you're a fan of it, I mean it's a, it's a kind of a fun song, I guess, because he's like oh breaking down like oh well, I see all these little things and da 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 da. But even then, I'm like I don't I don't know. I could see see the look the look on your face was like I have so much to say right now. I was like, go ahead. <laughs> this is the worst song in the show. <laughs> it, for so many. Okay, so first of all, like as we get through that scene, and actually, it's the second scene because after the overture, they're on the street, right? And then we meet Sherlock Holmes in the second scene, and well, I he's wasn't... in the first scene too. He helps catch the guy that's trying no. to shoot the whatever, whatever. And then, but you don't really... They Technically. Don't, uh, sure. Then you meet <laughs> Sherlock in the second scene for real. Mm-hmm. And so here's the thing. I, I think everyone knows... If you say Sherlock Holmes, everyone knows who that is. Whether or not you've read the any books or seen any other media related to this character, he's a big enough character right. in just the pop culture global atmosphere. You know who Sherlock Holmes is, right? He's a, yeah. a super genius, mystery-solving detective. Right. If he's smarter than everyone else, why are his lyrics so dumb? <laughs> it's all so simple. Nothing about this is simple, Sherlock. No one else can figure it out. Yeah. So you have to write him as wittier than like smart characters say smart things, but his lyrics are pun intended too simple. Yeah. Well, I have something that I'm going to come back to later <laughs> with this song, but okay. we'll, we'll say that. It just uh, oh, it it's... is. Yeah. He's like. I mean, it's. It's not particularly clever lyrically. It's not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not, uh, it's not, it, it's kind of a weird thing. It, like, it's not like a spoken word. It's not really like patter. It's it's kind of a weird thing because it's not a singy song. I mean, there's a clear melody. And yeah. in research, I've seen a lot of comparisons to My Fair Lady. And I think oh, the, sure. the, the show, yeah. in my opinion, this piece was written by people who saw like the Rodgers and Hammersteins and the Lerner and Lowe's uh, through the 50s and early 60s and thought, yeah, we can do that and just yeah. imitated that style. Mm-hmm. And it, ugh. <laughs> I don't think it works for this character. It's not that I don't believe Sherlock could be a character in theater. I just don't think it works as a musical. Sure. I think I, get could, that. I, I would rather see a Sherlock play. Yeah. And there's a lot of Sherlock plays. Like that's not that's not an uncommon thing. But this is the only Sherlock musical, like the only one that I found in my research, and that's probably for a reason. Mm-hmm. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> really, like pretty soon after that, we meet. Uh, well, we meet our two. Then we meet Holmes, and we meet Doctor Watson. Yes. Who I have I have thought on on Watson. Um. He does nothing. Nothing. In this show. Absolutely nothing. He does nothing. He slows uh, act two down with a boring number. Yep. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Which we'll get to. We'll get to that. Once we talk through the whole show, I'll kind of break down characters like in my, how I, how I saw them uh, on top of everything else in this show. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's just get, but let's get through the musical, the actual like music part. So I did, if you listen to, if you want to seek out the soundtrack and listen to this show, the second after the overture and it's so simple, the third song on the track, the third track, sorry, is I'm in London again. It's Irene Adler's introduction. Mm-hmm. Apparently. And I like, if you want to like look this up, you can after opening night, they changed her, her introductory song to something else. Uh, they changed it to a song called Buffalo bell. Um, I question why this song exists. I mean, I guess it's supposed to set up like, oh, Irene Adler is an actor from America and she's come over to London to perform in this show, whatever it is. I'm assuming that's how it's set up. I don't get it. I don't know why this song is in the show. Because they really liked Annie Get Your Gun? I <laughs> guess. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> um, there are two other songwriters in this show. It's not just Grudef and Jessel. Yeah. It's also 
Harnick and Bach. I am really from Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> that I just mm, what happened? <laughs> what happened? Because that makes me wonder as Bach well. Bach and Harnick are some of my favorite <laughs> musical the like. <laughs> uh, there are oh some of their work is great. So mm-hmm. what is this? Yeah. <laughs> so just to say it out there, uh, just to put it out there, out of the 14 songs in the show, Harnick and Bach wrote four. Mm-hmm. One of which being Buffalo Bell. And I don't know why this song exists. Uh, still, hey. I still question it. I mean, yeah. I don't. It's not a particularly entertaining song. Maybe it's supposed to set up, oh, Irene Adler is an actor, and so that's why she sings this song. Before she sings, I'm in London Lond- I'm in London again, which is also written by Harnick and Bach, and is probably my least favorite song in this show, and that's saying something, because <laughs> none of these songs are particularly good. <laughs> um, but I just don't like that song. It, it feels, it, as weird as this is to say, it feels older than the rest of the songs in the show. Like it feels like an even mm. older song yeah. than 1965. I can see and that. I, it just t- doesn't really fit in my opinion. I mean, I get why it's there. Irene needs to sing something, I guess, when she shows up. But, you know, that's just, that's kind of how I feel about that one. Um, <laughs> My notes, I literally wrote, what a lackluster introduction to this character. <laughs> I said, mu- musicals from this era have a vibe and even this is boring. So it's like, (laughs) I wrote, oh, good, a fucking play within a play. (laughs) I mean, this is what, that's what, that's something this show needed for sure, isn't it? Definitely. No, I think maybe it was really boring and they were like, we need another up number. And it's not that long of a piece. Mm -mm. Buffalo Bell is like, what, two minutes? Maybe. Right. Well, and the whole play is like two hours. Yeah. It's a, a pretty tight two hours. Yeah. Well, I think the production we watched ran, it was under two hours. And that was, mm, yeah. the the whole video was under two hours. That was including a two minute curtain call and an eight minute director speech. Yeah. <laughs> so it was 150. I mean, they might as well have included an actual 15 minute intermission instead of like, you know, having a, a brief one that like, it like pops up this intermission and it's there for like maybe 30 seconds. They just should have kept a whole 15 minute intermission. It might've made the made them a little bit longer. <laughs> So yeah, I don't I don't think that it was dragging. Like th- that is a problem of of some musicals where it's there's too much and it starts to drag and it needs to be trimmed down. Mm-hmm. So I think there was room to add this number and it just gave uh oh what's her face Inga Swenson mm-hmm. another fun thing to do because this is still. I mean, if we think about musical theater history, like the '60s, it's still uh, musical theater is escapism. Right. In addition to yeah. storytelling, so. Well, I mean, I got to say, in the soundtrack, e- Inga Swenson's pretty great. I mean, obviously, this is a kind of a, like a standout part for her. Mm-hmm. And because there's lots of, there, I mean, we'll talk about it a little bit more, too. I always I always say that, and I keep saying it in different things. But, like, obviously, yes, we're going to keep talking about it more. <laughs> but, like, there are, like, even having not being able to watch her performance, just hearing her on the soundtrack, it's like, oh, she's got some range. She's got some versatility. Mm-hmm. And it's that obviously is kind of like that. I think this show is kind of catered around her as opposed to like Sherlock, even though it's a Sherlock story. Yes. Oh, and yeah. she she was the one nominated for a Tony Award. Right. And he yeah. wasn't. So. Right. Well, I was going to get to that. OK, Talking sorry. About, like, sorry. Stuff. Anyway, stop getting ahead of me. OK. So uh, then after that song some plot happens honestly i i had a hard time following it i had a hard time following it not just because just because there's so many there's three different like i said there's three different things happening at the same time i'm not even sure what holmes is trying to investigate Uh, oh yes i do i remember now so the opening number is this guy comes to him he's like hey i sent this letter to irene adler but i'm engaged and I don't want my fiance to find out. So we can you go get this letter, steal this letter from her because she's here in London. And he goes, hmm, yeah, OK, sure. I'll take this case for whatever reason. He's like, no, I won't. Fine. No, I won't. Fine. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know why he decides to take this case. But then he goes out and he recruits not the police to like go search her apartment because I guess that's too 
obvious. He recruits Street Rabble. The Irregulars. The Baker Street Irregulars <laughs> to go and create a distraction so that he can go steal the letters from her hotel or wherever she's staying. The song that they sing, again, I kind of got Gilbert and Sullivan vibes <laughs> just because it feels, it, or even something like, yeah, I mean, yes, Gilbert and Sullivan vibes from like the police force, the goofy police force that's in Pirates of Penzance. That's what I got vibes from that. The, the song is called Leave It to Us, Gov. Is it the name actually, of the song. I heard it and went, oh, this is Consider Yourself from Oliver. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a little bit, yeah. I mean, we're just swapping like one British classic lit piece for another. For another, yeah. But that's what it it. Even it's. I don't think it's just the the dialect. I think the piece is just like, yeah. oh, it's just a bunch of boys singing you, this. You song. know what's funnier about that? Hmm. Oliver came out after this. Really? Really? Yeah. Oliver came out after this. Don't look it up. I'll tell you all this information later. Don't look it up. I'm going to tell you about. God, it, okay? keep talking. I'm not typing. Shut up. Stop typing. <laughs> if I was there, I'd smack your hands. Stop typing. Um, I wanted this. Some of this to be a surprise. Uh, it did not come out after Oliver. You're wrong. No, Oliver came out after this. No, is what it did I said. not. Oliver was produced in the West End in 1960. Oh, in the West End. So the musical existed. And then Broadway in well, 1962. Then, really? The film is 1968. Then my information I have is, is wrong then. Sorry. Because I looked, no, it's fine. I looked up something that said like, I looked up a thing that says musicals produced in 1965 and Oliver was on there. Oh. So that's Maybe why it was, was like, still running. Oh. Maybe, um, but yeah, but I specifically typed in premiered in 1965. Maybe I need to take a break before I talk about that and go back and do some more research. But I just looked at the one page, so that's probably just on me. Sorry. No, one of us fine. is a pretentious musical theater history nerd. No, I know. I know that. <laughs> so anyway, now that I've proved how much I don't know about musical theater, <laughs> um, we'll go back and talk about this. So okay. anyway, so leave it to us, Gov, this song here. Um, yes, it does sound a lot like "Consider Yourself" from Oliver. Uh huh. It was something that I that I thought about too. I don't know. It pretty much is that song. Now that you mentioned it, yeah. But considering where it's at in the show, I was like, I mean, it's, it's a fun bit part, but it still kind of ultimately feels out of place. It does inject some like life into this relatively one note show, at least for three minutes and nine seconds. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's kind of where I, how where I'm at on that one. I'm like, it's like, it's, I mean, consider yourself as one of the most recognizable songs from Oliver. Mm -hmm. So by essentially like, I don't want to say steal, but like borrow the type of like, uh, I don't even know if it necessarily borrows like the melody, or, I mean, it's just it's one of the it's they're very similar, but they're not the same song. Right. No, I, I think this comes from the creative team being familiar with what was popular in musical theater in the last decade or so mm -hmm. and imitating that. So I, yeah. I, I wouldn't say sure. that the song's plagiarized or anything, but it sounds very, it's the same kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. it's that song in this show. Sure. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. And so then mm -hmm. Sherlock Holmes decides to dress up as a priest, a reverend, Oh, okay. It's Reverend. A but, Reverend yes. and and pretend to need help and hang out in Irene Adler's apartment room wherever she is. <laughs> and she's an actor and she just buys it? At first it yeah, it seems at first yes. But but not yeah. really. She's so clever as we'll find out after she's her. She's just as clever as he is. Way too long Flip number her. that she definitely saw right through him because she's so smart. Yeah. She was like, oh no, my apartment's on fire. Here, go sit outside. And then she like, it's like, oh, I need to save this box. Thus, this box hands it to him just as the reverend. And then he opens it. And then, then it quote unquote clicks for her that she, oh, this is not some old man. This is Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. And then proceeds to sing this song where she's like toying with him in a way. Right, because she's like, "Oh, look at I have all these letters. I do love letters, hence the name of the song. <laughs> the very cleverly titled letters um letters, letters, I do love letters, yeah, she proceeds then to read through song three different letters, mm -hmm. one of which sets up a different storyline, which we don't really address. It's the um 
the story A Scandal in Bohemia. Uh huh. That's the first letter. And then that's kind of it. It doesn't, nothing comes of that particular plot that I can think of. Yeah. Well, and then there's a letter uh, from some guy in Wyoming. and Some guy in Wyoming who she sings. Then she sings with a Southern accent, which makes no sense if you're an American. And is that in the <laughs> cast recording too? Or is that just it a production? Sure watch? I didn't is. listen through the entire cast recording. I just went back and reminded myself of the songs. Mm-hmm. No, it's in the cast recording too. Yeah, she sings it in a Southern accent. When like terrible grammar, mm-hmm. because apparently that's what people that's how people from Wyoming talk. I loves you. I loves you. Yeah, and there's like a couple other things where it makes me laugh because I remember I was in a production of Radium Girls in college, and I played the lovesick or lo- lovesick cowboy. Mm-hmm. To which he says he's from Wyoming, and the director specifically told me he's like, "Do not do a southern accent." <laughs> he is from Wyoming. My wife is also from Wyoming. She does not talk this way. Uh huh. So don't do a southern accent. And I said, gotcha. But if you're a that. cowboy, you must be southern. I'm a rancher. I only wrote two things about that song, uh, and it's both referring to the Wyoming letter. I wrote, why is the Wyoming guy southern? And, ah, yes, the old suicide punchline. Yep. Because that's if hilarious. You, if you don't <laughs> say, yes, I'm going to shoot myself with my really expensive gun, I loves you. Great. Yeah. I just straight up wrote, like, the jokes in this song just fall flat. They're so bad. They're bad. Oh, not that. That's a bill. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, you've got to be uh, kidding me. Not yeah. that. That's a bill. She throws it. I think some of the issues are the book, and some of the issues are the performer that we happen to watch. <laughs> True. Yeah. I almost I so. went on Concord and got a copy of like a perusal copy of the libretto just so I could see what was actually happening. Cause sometimes mm-hmm. I couldn't understand really what was going on. Right. And, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to necessarily like <laughs> on this performer, but I really don't think she understood the character. Maybe not. <laughs> or maybe was intentionally trying to do something different. And I just don't think it worked. And she was yeah. not a strong singer either. <laughs> yeah. So like, I ugh. mean, when, you're gonna, when you think about like, this is the part that Inga Swenson was nominated at, uh, for a Tony for. Yeah. That's tough because, I mean, and I wrote this. I'll go ahead and say this now, but I wrote this down for a little bit later that if you want to play Irene Adler, you have to be willing to really commit because Irene needs to be pretty versatile for a performer in this show. She's all over the place. She does at least three different ways that she speaks. She's mm-hmm. three different tones or inflections and like or accents that she does. Right. While singing. Mm-hmm. And it's a soprano role. And it's a soprano role. So it's like, oh, you've got to be able to like bring it. And, you know, the performer we saw just I don't think was a strong enough performer to pull that off, unfortunately for her. But um, even then, it's like if it's done well, it could be a very impressive role if it's done well. Yes. Yeah. It's definitely the I'd say the best role in this show. If you're going to put it that way. Yeah. I think the person playing Sherlock like gets the you just get the like the leading man accolades because mm-hmm. obviously Sherlock Holmes is the main character. Right. But I don't think what he the stuff he has to do in the show is more difficult than the stuff she has to do. No, I don't think so at all. So I, I think yeah, I think you pick the show because you have a great Sherlock Holmes, like a charismatic, fun to watch performer, and then you also have an Irene Adler. Yeah. Well that's that's the thing, is like I also wrote that Sherlock Holmes really isn't like a funny series like there's not there's not a lot of comedy in the books that i can remember Mm -hmm. and so adding humor to sherlock holmes can feel very forced no matter where you put it right there's not a lot of humor in the books that you haven't read from what i understand from what i remember (laughs) how could you remember you haven't read them (laughs) true (laughs) well do do you remember any humor in the books when you read them no (laughs) i read one book right there's a lot of them, so it's a very small yeah. sample. Sure. And I think Hound of the Baskervilles is also more one of like the like more serious ones, I think. Again, I haven't really read them. We read it in October in my freshman English class because mm-hmm. it's literary and also spooky. Instead of reading Edgar Allan Poe, we're going to read this one story. But anyway, my point is that Sherlock can be very one note if you don't play him right. Mm-hmm. Or if you don't have good direction. 
And that's how I felt about the performance that we watched. Like, he was fine. The guy that played it was probably the best performer in the show. But mm-hmm. even then, there wasn't a whole lot to, like, pay attention to. Yes. Agreed. He was pretty pretty one note, pretty flat. That being said, the next song, uh, Cold Clear World, I guess there has to be a romantic subplot. That's, like, the only purpose, the only reason that this show exists. That this, that this Sorry, that this particular song exists in the show for me. When I teach musical theater to my students i tell them that a golden age convention of musical theater is that there are usually two love stories like there's an a plot and a b plot Mm -hmm. and in most cases the a plot love story ends up together and the b plot sometimes but like look for that because again it's this era of escapism and oh doesn't it feel good to like watch this sweet story in the theater Mm -hmm. so i think that's just an expectation of musical theater at the time and so i think that's why that's in there it's kind of forced i would have been much more interested in a irene adler john watson romance i think that would be more believable so what are the two romances then irene adler and sherlock and sherlock and moriarty like i don't know what the or sherlock sherlock and the game (laughs) (laughs) shock and his fan club uh no i i think maybe this bends the rule a little bit and doesn't quite follow it but i think that's where why we have a boring john watson number in act two sure maybe where he's like, I had a love, but she's dead. Yeah. I was married once. Thanks for being a bummer, John. We're going to move on. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, yeah, Cold Clear World is just a song where he's like, oh, I don't. Sherlock is like, I don't understand love. <laughs> I don't get it. I'm too smart for love. It makes zero sense to me. That's like the entire point of that song. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then I read and Adler's like, oh, but I can flirt with you. He's like, haven't you ever kissed someone? He goes, yeah. And that's pretty much like, that's the entire interaction. She's like, haven't you ever kissed someone? Yeah. <laughs> Let me awkwardly put your arms around me. Yeah. And he's like, he's like I am wh- uncomfortable. Why? Why are you doing this? Yeah. There's there's a mystery to solve, woman. <laughs> Technically, there's three. Anyway. There's three mysteries. And John Watson is clearly into her. So like... If you're that desperate, girl, turn around. He's right there. Yeah. But John Watson's not the smart one. Oh, Sherlock's playing hard to get. It's like, no, Sherlock's a dumb <laughs> <laughs> He's very smart, but he doesn't pick up on social cues. That's just how Sherlock Holmes is. Okay, let the, uh, this. here's our tangent for the episode. Would you rather <laughs> have someone smart or someone who's interested in you? Smart, hands down. Really? No. I'm No. No, I'd rather have someone who's interested in me. Like, like I wouldn't if if I show interest in someone and they're just kind of like, oh yeah, whatever, and then they don't show, they don't reciprocate that, then I wouldn't be interested anymore. You're not a chaser. No, I'm married. Not anymore. Well, yeah, no, I, <laughs> obviously not anymore. But before you were married, um, I don't, I don't really think that I was. I don't remember. But like, I mean, I think I was for like a a while, and then I was like, no, nah, it's not worth it. Like you put in, a, you put in so much effort, and then if you get nothing back, you're just like, "All right, we're gonna move on." Mm. I was like that in college, especially. Yeah, I'm well. And so okay, th- these are the thoughts that are running through my brain because I do get the appeal of like, "Ooh, a smart, alluring man." Mm-hmm. But if he's clearly like, if you're as forward as, "Haven't you ever kissed someone before?" and he's like, "Yep," <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's a clear sense. Like you saw through his reverend disguise. You can't see that he doesn't. He's not interested in you, and it's it's not like Watson's a dummy, right? Yeah, that's true. I don't know. I mean, he seems pretty dumb in this, like in comparison to Sherlock. Yeah, well, and Sherlock needs to be smarter, clearly, but clearly, but like the way that I I perceived it too, as I was watching it and listening to it as well, is that they had to write everyone significantly dumber than <laughs> Sherlock, because Sherlock is supposed to be like peak human levels of like genius right Uh and if you're not that it's hard to (laughs) write for that i feel like Mm. so they had to make everyone else significantly dumber and and by that they made john watson do nothing (laughs) they yeah they should have put everyone at sherlock where where sherlock is in the show is where everyone else should be and then sherlock needs to be elevated above that but they were unable to write to that elevation yeah that's how i how i perceive that Mm. Right after that is what I wrote. Um, this next song on the on the 
in the pecking order is what a night this is going to be, which is the act one closer. And I was like, you know, I stand corrected. I think this is the best song of the show because at least it's fun to watch and listen to. Is this the one my notes say, why are we getting naked on stage? <laughs> uh, yes, this is okay, the one where great. they're getting in disguise to go. And I'm, I, I think at this point they're going, this is when they like, at this point in the show, I was confused, but I think at this point, Sherlock has deduced that Moriarty is involved somehow and they're going to go catch him. They're going to go find him. That's what mm-hmm. they're trying to do at this point in the show. And he's recruited, not his partner, John Watson, to help him. He's recruited Irene Adler to help him. Mm-hmm. Right? And so this is a song they're going to go together to some place to try to find him. Now, when I just listened to the soundtrack, I thought, oh, they're going to go to like the opera or something. But they're going in disguise to try to find him. That's what I thought was happening. Mm-hmm. When I watched it, that is not what's happening at all. They're no. literally just going into the street. Yeah, they're going to pretend disguise. to be some cockney urchins in disguise. I, I do like the kind of juxtaposition where she's very excited because she's going to be with him. And he's like, how can I make myself look uglier? <laughs> he's like constantly doing stuff. He's like, how do my eyebrows? They look terrible. Good. And he puts them. <laughs> and he just keeps going. And for this me, that's funny. The whole sequence was very strange. So, again, the production we watched, it was a community theater production. I, I'm not expecting Broadway levels of quality here. But I do expect in general that community theater will be better than like high school theater. Just because they're going to have more adult performers who have... If they don't have more theater experience, at least they have more life experience. I think adults are more likely to jump in and be able to perform better than high school kids can just jump in and perform. Mm-hmm. Right. And so in in this version of the show, uh, they make this plan that they're going to get in disguise and go in the streets and try to find Moriarty or whatever they're doing. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, so they go to their respective rooms to change into their new fun costumes and Sherlock just takes his pants off so that we can have a joke <laughs> that his underwear is the British flag. Yeah. And as a person who regularly directs teenagers, that makes me super uncomfortable. Right. Like you could you could have the same joke with a modesty partition and just throw the flag underwear over the top of it, right? Ha, <laughs> hilarious. Sure. Yeah. Um and then there's a a whole bit where Irene Adler is with Daisy and maybe someone else. Mm-hmm. I I suspect the production we watched is not exactly the same as what is licensable today, uh, because this is not the Act One finale per Concord theatricals. Oh, it, even so, according to Concord, it's not the according finale. to Concord, it's not, it's not the, the Act finale. One finale. But oh, at the time, okay. it was licensed by Tams Whitmark, so things may have changed. I okay. I uh, don't know of a way to research that. Like, right. I, I guess we could dig into it more if we really wanted to. But anyway, so they say like, oh, Miss Adler, which beautiful ball gown do you want to wear? This blue one or this green one? Here's some beautiful choices. And then they put her in the ugliest brown thing I've ever seen. Yeah. And it's like, I get she's trying to be a street urchin, but why are we <laughs> recommending ball gowns? So I think I, I remember that kind of being in the Broadway recording as well, but they changed the colors of the dress because they didn't have the. Apparently, did they might <laughs> this production might not have had the colors that that uh, they recommend that mm. they bring out to her. One is because I remember one. The first one is supposed to be red. The second one is blue, and the third one is mauve. Right. But I don't think that they had those. Probably it was like blue and green. But then I don't think she says she's gonna wear the mauve one because they rec- They're like, what about the mauve one? And she's like, oh, it looks great on you. Yeah. And then Daisy's like, oh, with my butt? <laughs> I think she says derriere. How oh, this bustle Jeez. wouldn't look good with my butt. Like, girl. <laughs> Here, wear this brown thing. And then and then Sherlock Holmes feels the need to teach Irene Adler how to act. That's the <laughs> shit that I want from him. <laughs> Where was why does he sing a song? Oh, it's all so simple, and then everyone figures out what the heck he's talking about because it is far too simple and we all understand. Yeah, but, but she's she's Irene Adler. You're going to teach her how to act. Yes, that's Sherlock Holmes brand. <laughs> it's like, did he say? Did he say like you're saying your A's wrong or something like that? Like it's I, pretty funny. I don't even remember. I just wrote, why does he? Why does he have to teach her how to act? And it's like, oh yeah, because I mean, mansplaining wasn't a thing yet. But like, 
He's way smarter than her, so he obviously knows more than world-renowned actress yeah. Irene Adler. Sherlock Holmes was a D-bag before D-bags were known in popular culture. <laughs> That's what he is. He just is That's just his demeanor. I, his demeanor. I don't think he meant it in a mean way, but... I mean, like, it, it, may just, it takes me back to, like, anything Sherlock I've ever watched, right? So, like, the TV show Sherlock with Benedict Cumberbatch, he just says something that is, that is just, like, it's a, it's not incorrect like he what he's saying is correct but the way he says it gets him slapped or gets something thrown in his face most of the time that's just how he is so i i agree with you in saying that is the most sherlock line out of this entire (laughs) show yeah he's like no no you're not acting you're not doing this right and she's like let me show you how i'm freaking irene adler i'm a (laughs) professional actor (laughs) yeah and that's just funny you know that's probably the best the, the best exchange in the whole show and it comes right before they just basically walk off stage together. Um, yes. I think that's why I was like, this is the best song in the show is for exchanges like that. Um, but I mean, out of context doesn't really work. I don't think, but again, that's not a necessarily criteria for like, say like a thespian piece or something like that. Mm. Okay. So the real end of act one, the real end of act one is guess what? He gets caught or Sherlock Holmes's character pretends to get caught. Oh, no. Pretends he caught by Moriarty, who we just now meet. We've heard about him a little, little bit. But now we meet Moriarty for the first time. Mm -hmm. And like almost all the way through act one, we meet Moriarty. Right. And he shows up. And for whatever reason, he doesn't see through his disguise right away. Mm -hmm. For some reason, he doesn't. Then he's like, oh, okay, it is you. And he's like, well, guess what? I have a bomb and I'm going to blow. I'm going to blow up london i don't even know what he's i don't know what he's trying to do i don't understand why moriarty what moriarty is trying to do he's there i get it he's sherlock holmes number one antagonist right Uh he's his arch nemesis yes having not having moriarty in this show makes less sense to me however what does he do exactly what's his goal what's his plan uh, I I didn't really understand. I was confused because <laughs> Moriarty was played by an older woman. Yeah, that was also confusing. They still call him James. Uh, like, yeah. I think they said like, I mean, honestly, I think they said, oh, she, but then her name was James. I thought that was kind of strange. Yeah, I I don't know. Maybe they didn't have a Moriarty and this lady was willing to do it. Or, I mean, I, mean, I don't want to assume anything about this performer i couldn't see the picture very well i have a very good friend from high school who is male and has a a, a relatively high-pitched voice and especially on the phone gets confused for a woman all the time Mm -hmm. so i don't know if it's that kind of situation where like we couldn't see and it was a man the whole time or like I, i don't know i mean it seemed to me that it was an older woman and i could be i could have been wrong i could be wrong it didn't work for me uh, no. There was a line about a magnificent chronometer of death, mm-hmm. and then they pulled the curtain, and it looked like a propane tank. <laughs> yeah. And and then Sherlock and Watson were not restrained? No, they were. They were. Sherlock was restrained <laughs> behind his back, and but Watson's hands were restrained in front of him. He's like, holding his cane, but his hands are tied There together. were multiple times where they were both using their hands, and... Oh, well. And they were just like <laughs> pointing a gun, like stay here. And then they run away with, so they don't get exploded. But like, man, if I'm going to die anyway, shoot me. I don't want to be exploded. Just shoot me. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's, here's, here's something that I noticed as well. I was like, why is Moriarty leaving his people here to also get exploded, exploded. by this bomb? <laughs> by this <laughs> That's something I thought was, thought was confusing. But I'm like, I guess not really. These people are willing to die for him, I guess. So they're like, oh, I'll volunteer to like watch them so that they can stay. But yeah. He sets the bomb, he walks off stage, and then they just sit there. So <laughs> it's like but but they have they have enough time to to for Watson to sing a whole sad song about his wife's not here anymore. Well, and I I think this is supposed to be the end of act 1. It is. Yeah. So so uh you know, we set up all this tension, we're like, "Oh no, what will happen? Come back in 15 minutes." And that yeah. that makes more sense. And again, the show's not too long where I don't think we could have a 70 minute act one and then a shorter right. act two. Like, I think that's fine. I mean, I think it's pretty much just pretty safe to say that there's nothing in this show particularly stands out. <laughs> but like we we just got through. We just got through act one. That's right? just act one. 
that's just act one. And then Moriarty's like, haha, a bomb. And then he leaves. And I think the, the performer on the soundtrack is very good. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm also just like, I have thoughts about if I were to ever direct a sh- this show specifically. Um, I have thoughts on how I would probably try to do certain things. And the handling of Moriarty is one of them. Okay. Uh, I think he needs to be in it more, but like in the background. Like he's always there. He just kind of like passes by or he's just kind of maybe like you turn and like he's there, then he's gone or something like that. So like he's like kind of a threat that's around. Mm. But I also don't necessarily know if the play is structured, the musical is structured well enough to allow for that. I Yeah, I do think it could be interesting again not having seen the script at all but if this were the type of story where it's told through Moriarty's eyes Mm -hmm. because if you if you don't know anything about Sherlock Holmes Mm -hmm. I don't know that you would know Moriarty like you would know if you know he's a detective and that's it I don't know that you would know Moriarty yeah I guess most people probably have at least enough context to know that he's like the arch nemesis. I th- I think so. Yeah, that that feels right for me. But it it just feels it kind of feel the way it's written in it kind of feels like fan fiction. Right. Like, oh, he just he just appears. We have to have Moriarty. And then cor- yeah. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't Irene Adler an antagonist for Sherlock in the original she canon? She is in the in in the canon, yes. In the Doyle canon she is, yes. I believe that it's you I mean, at least in modern times, it's been written more like she, there is something between them. Like there is like, ke- they have chemistry in, in a way, hmm. but probably because they're both two of the most brilliant people on the planet. Right. So there, they do have chemistry, but it's not like, and it, it, it does come off as more, I think, especially from a, for a modern day audience, it's seen as more of like a, um, romantic type chemistry but it doesn't mm. necessarily have to be played that way yeah so she's you know? she's a bond girl <laughs> essentially she's more of a she's like she's more of a femme fatale yeah she's like the og femme fatale <laughs> in in those books you know so so um, i i think if you eliminate that and in your you're trying to make her just a like a pure romantic interest within mm-hmm. the context of this musical then you need to really up the antagonizing from Moriarty because he doesn't even come in until the end of act one or, you know, right. the version that we watched, it wasn't until act two Act two because right. intermission was earlier. So it's like, I don't like, who cares? Oh, oh, that Moriarty, yeah. he's doing stuff and pissing me off. Like, don't care. Sherlock. <laughs> yeah. What exactly did I write here? I wrote, well, I did write, I, I wrote a couple of different notes, but yeah, like, I did write that Moriarty is so underutilized in this show. Mm-hmm. It's a huge disappointment because like Sherlock and Moriarty are like the Batman and Joker. Yeah. It's like, that's how there's, that's what their relationship is like. Right. And so if you don't use that, then what's the point of him being there at all? Right. So I think a good rewrite would be put him in right after the overture, mm-hmm. like make a prologue where let, like let him explain what's going on and then make an epilogue Mm -hmm. with this like let him come in and and i don't know it's like aaron burr and hamilton yeah he he needs to do that kind of work for me to to buy into that as a character for sure i think that's that's a that's a good way to go (laughs) i will say in my notes i did write that you know uh moriarty needs a song too because he's he's a bad guy which is why we have i shall miss you i shall miss you yeah which is better when it's actually saying in the production that we say yeah. we watched she did not sing she tried her best she tried her best but didn't sing it was more it was much more kesha like <laughs> sing talking like early kesha hey um do not insult kesha like that hey i know kesha can sing i've heard kesha <laughs> sing really really well but like early kesha's like sing talky it was very sing it was but it wasn't even that it was just like i'm going to talk the lyrics and you're going to play music behind me that's essentially what it was. But anyway, <laughs> I don't I don't want to crap on a specific performance just because we that's the one that we associate with this show because we yeah. saw it. I'm trying to see the musical for more like on its own merit, like taking into the account the professional soundtrack that that, that does exist. Um, instead of just this one this one particular show. But um I will say that I do think that this Moriarty thing was done better in The Great Mouse Detective. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. No, I mean, you're honestly, absolutely right. <laughs> Radigan's a better Moriarty than Moriarty in this show. Sure is. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> and he's got two songs. And Goodbye So Soon is pretty much I Shall Miss You, but better. But better. <laughs> the World's Greatest Criminal Mind and Goodbye So Soon. Man, like those are like those songs are just those are really good villain songs just in general. And that's what this song this show's missing, a really good villain song. Yeah. Cause and he also a really good villain, but that's beside the point. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, uh, well, actually, right after I Shall Miss You, they sing Roof Space, uh, which is the opening of Act Two, which I don't quite understand why it is in the show either. Um, I mean, oh, hey, you remember those uh, crazy orphans that we met, those street urchins? Here they are again, singing another song. I wrote down, this is why people hate musical theater. <laughs> This is why my husband does not like going to musicals with me because he feels like there might be a number like this in every show. <laughs> Tell me more, Siobhan. Tell me more. It's just annoying. Can you elaborate on the annoying? <laughs> well, first of all, I had a hard time understanding what they were saying because they're, they're doing it in the new dialect from what the rest of the show is. and Maybe that was just a directing oh, choice. but Roof Spice. Roof Spice. I couldn't... <laughs> I, for a while, thought they were saying... It's like that in the soundtrack, too, by the way. Blue Spice. And I was like, oh, is this is this about drugs? It oh, is, is the 1890s. The, this, is, this is the sci-fi part of the show where aliens <laughs> show up. I couldn't blue understand. Blue Spice, them. Blue Spice. No, I hate... Yeah. It... <laughs> the, the, like... Where they try to get the audience to interact a little bit, and mm-hmm. it's like... I don't know. It's like Shapoopy from The Music Man. Like, why is this song here? Well, Shapoopy's a bop, that's why. You would think that. <laughs> it, it's the act two fun number. It's yep. positivity from The Little Mermaid. It's, yeah. It, yeah, it's Shapoopy from The Music Man. It's That's all the examples I've got think right now. Think of one other example, <laughs> Siobhan. Musical, you said, oh, musical theater history. Yeah, okay, give me one more example. It's Human Again from Beauty and the Beast. Okay, fine. <laughs> You have two Disney examples. <laughs> Do you want some more? I would love some more. It's non Disney ones. Um Past My Prime from Lil Abner. I I'm forgetting every musical that I know. Isn't Blow Gabriel Blow at the beginning of Act Two and uh Anything Goes? I'm trying specifically you to think of me. things from this time. <laughs> um it's No Way to Stop It from The Sound of Music. There's so many. It's the act two opener. It's it's like people are still probably coming back to their seats. We need something to make people happy and get them back into the show that doesn't further the plot and all the conflict that we left hanging at the end of act one. Mm-hmm. And that's Rafe Spice. Yeah, I don't get this song at all. <laughs> By the way, if you ever try to look up lyrics for this show, you can't. They don't exist. Like every every website I normally go to to find lyrics for songs they're not on here. I Ooh. could not find any of them. When I wanted to quote lyrics, I had to go back and re-listen to all the songs or specific parts of the songs that I knew I wanted to, to pull. Huh. Look at that. Baker Street pulls other music things, to be fair. There's a lot of other songs called Baker Street. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, but anyway. It's best forgotten. Yeah. Okay, so Act, act two. 2 opener. It's just, is is it's there. Act 2. So, right. So, after this number that is there, we go back to, I was like, oh, hey, remember? Sherlock and Watson are trapped in this room next to a bomb with henchmen that are still there <laughs> waiting to also get exploded. I can't remember if this is before or after what you're talking about. If they switch scenes, because uh, the scenes change back and forth quite a bit. But they Irene do, yeah. Adler, it must be right at the end of Ruth's space. It's right, Irene yeah, Adler right. comes in and she's like, I want to help him. It's a matter of life and death. And uh, they're all like, meh. <laughs> until until yes. she says that. It's like, well, yeah, if you acted like a hot female lead, maybe they'd be listening to you. Yeah, right. <laughs> Show some cleavage. Yeah, there you go. Right. Act like you're in love with him and not like you're Mama Rose. <laughs> not like you're in like with him. In like with him. You just want a smart man to pay attention to you. Girl, it's not going to happen. Everyone stop you what you're doing and pay attention to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. But yeah, so yeah, she gets the street urchins to follow her wherever, like she knows where he is if somehow, uh, but they go find out, like she goes out looking for him. And then we cut back to Watson and Sherlock sitting next to the bomb 
And then Watson sings a, sa- a sad song about his wife being dead. <laughs> There's not really another way to even like to summarize that song. That, that I think that was perfect. I wrote, oh, right. Watson's also in this show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Watson's also here. He might, we might as well give him a song, too. That's what I, that's what I have. Like, oh, yeah, I forgot. Watson's here. Um, but yeah, that's the, his obligatory, like, oh, so he, your sidekick needs a song. Here you go, sidekick. Throw you a bone. We need to bring it down after roof space. Yeah. We'll throw you a, one, of, one of your wife's bones. You'll be fine. <laughs> oh, boil it. <laughs> boil it. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I don't, I don't feel good about that. <laughs> that was... <laughs> Was that just off the cuff? Cool. Yes, it was. Wow. Oh, I don't feel good about That's that. Anyway, mean for you. It was mean. It was, that was mean even for me. Uh, that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? <Ooh. laughs> oh, boy. Anyway. Um, so basically, after that sad song, uh, the henchmen are still there. Irene and the rabble show up and are there to rescue Sherlock. And then he just goes, okay, he just stands up and he's not bound anymore. And then Watson's like, WTH, bro. And then Sherlock's basically like, well, if you were better at this, you would know. And that's pretty much what he says. He's like, well, be better at this. Plus, besides, he's like, he's like, I, I, put my, I had them bind my hands like this for a reason because I knew it could be easier to escape. He's like, also, I didn't tell you because you're not good at subtlety. Essentially, is what he tells Watson to his face. Mm -hmm. He's like, and then he goes, bloop, pulls his hands out of the ropes, and Watson's like all tied up still. Like his hands are tied around his cane in the production we saw. And so, like, okay, well. (laughs) He really liked that cane. I don't know why the henchman didn't take the cane away. Right. You know what's harder to do? Run with a limp. (laughs) It's harder to run with a limp. Yeah, I just wrote in all caps Sherlock, you could have saved yourself the whole time. Of course. He's Sherlock Holmes. Then why sit here for a while? Because Watson has to sing his song, Emily. <laughs> we need to build tension while we wonder if the propane tank will explode. It was so small. How could it be a magnificent chronometer of death? And it was the tiniest little propane tank I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the entire thing was just C4. And C4 didn't exist in that's, 1871. That's not magnificent. <laughs> no, that's just not. a bomb. Anyway... So after Sherlock basically nonchalantly disarms a bomb in the equivalent of like a Victor, uh, uh, is it Victorian? Is that yeah, Victorian yeah. England version of waiting till one second, like in every sci-fi show <laughs> ever. He just walks up and he go, he just goes, blip, 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 and then he disarms the bomb and he's like, hey, we have to. It's like Watson, let's go. We got to go get Moriarty, and they leave, and then Irene stays in the room with a now deactivated. But still potentially dangerous bomb. And oh, by the way, he does insult her for coming to save his life. Yep. <laughs> he does do that. He's like, Why would you come here and do something? You're stupid to come here and try to rescue me. And she's like, Well, I was like, He's like, You put your life at risk for no reason. Yep. And then he just, and then he just leaves. <laughs> he just leaves the room. <laughs> and then so she sits down and she sings her, her, a song called I Do It Again, which is literally this, like, what you think it is. It's her being like, Well, he was a jerk to me. And I risked my life to save his, but I'd do it again anyway because I, I love, love him. him. Yeah, my only note for this was like, I, is this the I is this the I want song? But it's so far into the show, I don't know. There, yeah, there's not. Is this the I want song? I don't know. Yeah, this is like if Ariel sang "Part of Your World" right before Ursula showed up. <laughs> she she kind of does. No, I mean like before Ursula show, shows up to ruin the wedding. Like oh. that's what this is like. <laughs> She sings part of your world and then Ursula shows up to ruin the wedding. That's what this is like to me. Yeah. I don't get it. <laughs> I'm like, it's, just, it's just, it's just, it's not a, it's a boring song because every song on the show is pretty boring. Mm-hmm. And then like nothing really comes of it. It's just kind of like, oh, I'm sad now that Sherlock was so mean to me, but I'd do it again anyway to save him because I love him and blah, 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 blah. Nothing really comes of it. And then basically they show up and be like, oh, yeah, we still got to go get Moriarty. And she's like, okay, next scene, let's go. That's <laughs> pretty much what happens. It's like there's nothing comes of this scene, really. No. And then 
very soon after that, we have the final conflict or confrontation from the Sherlock Holmes story, The Final Problem, where Sherlock and Moriarty come face to face. And there's somehow there are, for some reason, they are now, I think, on a mountain where like where the story is. Yeah. So there's a in whatever song, uh, the in pursuit. Oh right. Then right. somehow, uh, Sherlock Holmes has discovered that Moriarty has taken off in a balloon, but he knows that he he doesn't have enough fuel to get out of England and to Europe. So he's like, he must be going to a coastal town. And then I think. In the lyrics somewhere, it say that, oh, he's going to go to Dover. And so then they go to Dover, too. Right. And so they're on right. the cliffs. That's right. The cliffs of Dover, right. Uh, that makes more sense. I forgot about, I mean, honestly, I forgot about that song. <laughs> Me, too. <laughs> for, uh, pursuit. That's I right. don't remember like, what it sounds like, but I do remember and, that and bit. And the production that we watched, it was that scene was played for laughs. But, like, this is a very serious part of the show. It's, it's like, yeah, it's they're going attention. They're going to catch Moriarty. But they played it for laughs because they, like, and I don't know if it was intentional or not. The way that they set the carriage, like this, I mean, honestly, <laughs> oh, the, set yeah, that the, they, the, the set that they had was like, they utilized what they had and I'm not mad about it. Cause I was like, you know what? Good on you for using, like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of scenes in this show than different places. Yeah. So good on them for having all these different, like cool things they could pull out of walls and shift around. It was like, it worked. For it, what they yeah. And do. it made the scene changes go by very quickly, which I quickly, which was like little mermaid could learn something. But anyway, <laughs> Um, one of the they pull out a slide and it's a carriage and they have carriage wheels and they set them down next to chairs and then they sit in the carriage and start like bouncing like they're in a carriage and people started laughing which like I get that's pretty funny but the moment I saw that I was like this is very 39 steps of you to do it this way <laughs> yeah. right um, because like yeah what you're doing is pretty funny and entertaining but this is a very like serious part of the show right mm -hmm. so it's like you're like I said, you're getting to the final problem. You're getting to the big climactic, essentially battle of wits between these two intellectual geniuses. And so you're getting to this point, and then it's like, oh, okay, so let's downplay this. Essentially, as, as how I felt it was like. Mm. And it's not a song. It's just it's not not from what I can remember. It's not. I mean, there are lyrics, and it is a song, but it's not super singy. There's a melody. Again, it's very similar to like. Um, it's so simple in the sense that like it's not like Holmes is sitting there deducing all these issues and Watson's actually there to help him. But like this, yeah, this this part, it's like it's supposed to be very tense. And if you downplay that, I think it doesn't work as well, because like right when they get like the next the literal next scene, though, is Sherlock confronting Moriarty right after that. Right. And then it's the whole thing, too, where like, oh, they like kind of struggle for a bit and then they go off the falls. Mm -hmm. Right. And then. It is now presumed both of these characters are now dead. Like the, the production we saw, they brought two coffins on stage and they like crossed and then went off. Uh huh. Um, so like, okay, so it's presumed now that both of these characters are dead. And there's a scene soon after that where Watson is sitting alone at Baker Street and Irene comes in and they talk for a bit. And she's basically like, oh, I'm going to go back to America even because Sherlock's dead now. I'm going to go back to America. Right. And Watson's like, okay. I think what she says to him is like, oh, we'll always have, you know, our connection through him or whatever it is. So I was like, you know, John, you're a widow. You just go with her. <laughs> I would I would go with her. Yeah, he gave up on her pretty easy. Pretty when fast. When she yeah. comes in, he's like, ooh, and then he's like, ah. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. But anyway, um, but she decides to come. She decides to go to America, go back to America. And then Sherlock just... Pops right back in after that. Like, pops He's like, in hey, from the kitchen. I've been here the whole time. Thanks for not giving away my secret, Watson. Yep. And he's like, hey, you're a and <laughs> Which is like, this is the best scene for Watson in the show where he calls he calls Holmes on his bullshit. <laughs> it's very funny. It's like, but like, honestly, that is what, that's what happens in the, in the stories sometimes. Like it happens in every like filmed media i've seen of sherlock holmes there are scenes where watson just turns around and he goes like hey you're being a dick and he's like he just calls him on his bullshit and i'm like hey that's always the best scene for 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 watson <laughs> and like i really i i mean i wrote when i was writing up by taking doing character breakdowns that in this show watson is useless he does nothing mm -hmm. he's even more useless than he normally would be in these in these types of media yeah 
Like he does less than nothing in this show. He's there. He takes some notes, and then he gets caught, captured, sings a song about his dead wife, and then he like the his one of his very last scenes. He calls Holmes on his bullshit, and that's the like best scene for him. That the best acting scene for for Watson. Yeah, this entire show because he shows up. Holmes because Sherlock's like, yeah, thanks for not saying anything, and he goes like, you're a d- <laughs> and I'm done with this crap. Is essentially what he says. In so many words, right? Yeah. So what else is there, you know? (laughs) And then after after this confrontation, Watson just kind of leaves. He just walks out. And then I believe Chief Inspector Lestrade shows up. Well, and there's something about... So Sherlock is like, oh, I'll make a magic potion to figure out where he is. Yeah, something like that. Aren't you a man of science? Why are you making a magic potion? (laughs) Yeah, I forget what he's doing, but he's trying. He's trying to figure out. Oh, he's trying to figure out where the jewels are, right? Because like Moriarty stole a bunch of jewels or something. Yeah. So he's trying to figure out where they are. He some for some reason has one of Moriarty's shoes, and he's using a he's doing a chemical experiment to figure out where he has been to find where the jewels are. Okay. Right. That makes this more is sense. A, this is what he's trying to do. He's trying to, yeah. It it does come off very much like he's trying to make a magic potion. He's like That's not what he's trying your to do. Crystal bar, he's, your crystal ball, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> like, where's Moriarty? Yeah. He is trying to figure out where the jewels are. So he's doing these different chemical experiments, trying to figure that out. And then he finds a note or something in Moriarty's things, I guess, that says, you know, the first line of Mark Antony's speech from Shakespeare's julius caesar yes the friends roman countrymen you know Mm -hmm. and then he figures out oh and then he remembers something that moriarty said in their in their final conflict about um he quoted that quoted that that play and then the next line had something to do with like bury the gold with your bones or something like that Mm -hmm. um and so he figures out oh well all the jewels that he stole are in his coffin so basically, Sherlock and his some of his henchmen, not his henchmen, that he recruits the rabble, the Baker Street regulars, whatever the regulars, the Baker Street regulars, and the police, and they go and basically crash Moriarty's funeral. <laughs> um, at, but at one point, like they do a re, like and it's not on the soundtrack, but they do a reprise of um, "I Will Miss You," mm-hmm. whatever it is. They do a reprise of that. But it's I will miss you, James Moriarty. And uh, they're like, oh, let's look on him one last time. And they open up his coffin and there's a bunch of jewels in there because, of course, there is because Sherlock is a genius. So all the people that are there who are all these kind of seedy individuals start pilfering all the jewels and they sing a song called Jewelry. And they start putting on all this all this gold and they're singing about how pretty they look and like, oh, I can't go out there without my jewelry. And then this is where... I noticed the second use of the lyric of derriere in this show. <laughs> it is said twice. I didn't catch that one. So the first time you did catch, I it's caught in that the one. Song. It's in. Yeah. It's uh, when uh, Irene Adler's What a night ready. this is going to. So in yeah. the and what a night this is going to be. Here's the exchange. It's Daisy and Irene. Uh huh. Daisy, what about the mauve, ma'am? Irene, what? The mauve with the bustle. She says, "Gorgeous on, on you." On you. And what with says, my, my derriere? derriere? Yeah, and then I she says, that. "I've simply got nothing to wear." That's their whole exchange. Yep. In jewelry, the use of the word derriere comes in the chorus where it says, "Out on Leicester Square, diamonds out my derriere." <laughs> and they say that in the song twice because it's part of the chorus. <laughs> I but, didn't yeah. catch that either time. I think I was just. I was distracted by the fact that the casket they were carrying was the only person who would have fit in that casket was the little boy on stage and on maybe stage, barely. Right? It was yeah. tiny. And and then they were just the, two seconds before this, they're crying about, oh, we'll miss you, James Moriarty. And then they're like, ooh, jewels. And they start, <laughs> start, <laughs> start covering like, themselves, start themselves in long in costume jewels. pearls, like yeah. all of them, all these men. In Victorian, quote unquote, top hats and suits, putting yeah. long strings of pearls around their necks. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> but that's the whole song. It's like, yeah, 
out on Leicester Square. Diamonds out my derriere. Diamonds That's out the my second derriere. time derriere is used to make a rhyme in this show. Out of 14 songs, that same word is used twice. And it, I was like, wait a minute. Like, I had to stop and go back and re listen to it to make sure that's what I heard. Because I was like, okay. But honestly, after I did some research and I knew, I figured out who Raymond Jessel is, uh, like who he was. Yes. That did not surprise me in the least once I learned who he was. Mm. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy uh it just was like for, i just was like you have got to be kidding me also what a weird song to sing last in this that's show the, yeah that's the last <laughs> that's number last in, the song show. in the show it's such a weird song to end this show on agreed i mean like right after this basically they all show up and they like the police take all the jewels back and then Holmes then hears Moriarty's disembodied voice and figures, ha ha, he must not be dead. I'm going to go look for him. And Watson's <laughs> like, okay, great, let's do it. And then Holmes is like, oh, I need to go to Charleston. And he's like, Charleston, that's in America. And he goes, yes, it is. And then he leaves. And Holmes, like Watson starts to like take notes like he would. And then he just goes, nah. And then <laughs> then he leaves too. And that's the end of this show. There's yeah. no big finale number. I mean, at the least thing, like honestly, they did I know they did they just did a reprise of I Will Miss You, right? Mm-hmm. Or whatever that song is called. Is that what that song's called? Uh I think so. I shall miss you. I shall miss you, yeah. The, I, I shall miss you. So I know they just did a reprise of that, but I honestly feel like Watson should do a second reprise of that song when Holmes leaves and he's not going with him or something there needs to be something else tacked on to the end of this show that's not just like unspoken gig bye and then the show's over but like you're saying if if moriarty does a prologue and an epilogue like burr and hamilton then it makes more sense Mm -hmm. and you can have an end an actual end tag that's not just like and then he's gone you know. Well, yeah, Moriarty only appears twice. In this entire show. In the yes, entire Moriarty show, only, only twice. twice. And so, I don't know. I guess if you're a person who, who, again, hasn't really had a lot of exposure to Sherlock Holmes as a character, like you haven't read a bunch of the books or watched the TV show or seen mm-hmm. it in the movies or whatever. Again, I haven't done all of that, so maybe I'm incorrect here. But if Moriarty is the big bad... Like the big bad for Sherlock. Um, why is he only on stage twice? Yeah. He's he's not really threatening. He stole some jewels. Oh no. Yeah, that's kind of it. And guess what? I made a bomb. I made a bomb. It's magnificent. Yeah. Leave small. Underwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sherlock's anyway. gonna disarm it in like two seconds. But yeah, but that's it. That's how the show ends and Ugh. it's just kind of it just kind of is over. And you know, I talked about the little mermaid how that show fizzles at the end man this is so much worse than that (laughs) so much worse (laughs) so much worse than that it's just it's a very unsatisfying ending the this entire show is pretty unsatisfying honestly but the last note i put in the show is after that last song i wrote the game is afoot indeed because it's it sets you up for like a sequel or continuation and they don't do a lot of they don't do a lot of sequels or continuations of a, a ton of musicals, unless you're Disney right, or Hansel. Andrew Lloyd Webber, or uh, Bye Bye Birdie. Bye Bye Birdie has a sequel. Uh huh. What's that one? Isn't it called Bring Back Birdie? Oh, I don't know. I'm asking you. I I think that's what it's called. Yep, Bring Back Birdie, 1981. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't know that. Okay, well there you go. I was thinking of Cats too, Jellicle Boogaloo, but you know, <laughs> Love Never Dies. Yeah. High School Musical too, <laughs> and then Love Never Dies Senior Year. Love Never Dies Senior. Year. <laughs> uh, oh God, when we have to cover Love Never. Dies. <laughs> yeah. I will anyway. die. So, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, let's talk about the creatives. Because, okay, so uh, there's some stuff there. There is some stuff here. We, we touched on it a little bit, but um, so this show. 
the book was written by Jerome Coopersmith. Um, couldn't find a ton of information on him, but Concord actually has a little bit about him on their website and says that he is a, um, says uh, Jerome Coopersmith is a distinguished dramatist who has written plays for television, for the legitimate stage, and audio dramas for radio broadcasting. He has won a Tony nomination for his play Baker Street, the Broadway musical based on the adventures of Sherlock Holmes, um, which is correct, I believe. It, 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 he was nominated for Best Author, or Best Book Writer, essentially, was what it would be now. Um, it says, It remains the only theater event in history that features the great detective singing while in pursuit of the evil Professor Moriarty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's al- also the co-author of The Apple Tree, the three-part musical revived on Broadway recently for which he adapted the Mark Twain stories of Adam and Eve. His play Eleanor, about the early life of Eleanor Roosevelt, was selected by the Smithsonian Institution to be performed in Washington, D.C. in conjunction with the Eleanor Roosevelt Centennial. So he's done some stuff. He says he's also written some. He was also the principal writer on the original series of Hawaii Five-0. Um, he also wrote for se- for the television series Streets of San Francisco and Spencer for Hire. He's also written a half dozen made-for-TV movies, including An American Christmas Carol. So he went on and he he's he's done some stuff. I, I believe he's still alive. Um, it says that he Mr. Cooper Smith holds the rank of adjunct professor in the City Colleges of New York. He teaches script writing. So yeah, that's that's pretty cool that he that he's still around. That's pretty. That's, I think that's pretty neat. Um, I think that while the book for this particular show is not for this specific show is not particularly strong. Um, I think he had a hard job because he picked three different stories to adapt as opposed to maybe adapting one or two, Mm. you know? Um, So, I mean, if you want to include Irene Adler, that's the one I believe that includes, she's the most prominent in the scandal in Bohemia one, I believe. Um, And then the final problem is the other one with Moriarty. But I mean, he had a hard job, so I, I don't necessarily blame him for that. But so he wrote the book and then we have our two uh, songwriters, Marion Grudeff and Ray Jessel, who are both sadly no longer with us. Mrs. Grudeff, she died in uh, 2006, and uh, Mr. Jessel died in 2015. Uh, so relatively recently, you know. Uh, but uh, Mrs. Uh, Marion Grudeff, she was a Canadian concert pianist and musical theater composer. Um, she performed with the, the Toronto Symphony Orchestra at the age of 11 which is pretty impressive Mm -hmm. Um, with this show. She actually, um, she and just as just as a Grudef and Jessel subsequently collaborated on the songs for the Broadway musical Baker street. Uh, They moved to New York city where the show ran for more than 300 performances. So it, it actually ran for 311 performances from its opening to its closing. And uh, they, they also worked together on a show, uh, a new version of hell's a poppin, uh, which is a musical review um, and they also co-wrote the musical Life Can Be Like Wow, but I've never actually heard of that one either. Have you ever heard of that? No. No? Okay. Um, it was That was produced at the Charlotte uh, Charlottetown Festival in 1969. So they wrote that relatively soon after they finished Baker Street, it seems. Um, one of the things I found the most interesting, though, is that uh, in eight, 1981, she continued to teach piano privately uh, in Toronto until her retirement, and during this time, she worked as a musical director at Hart House Theater, where she became a mentor to Don McKellar and Lisa Lambert, who would go on to write The Drowsy Chaperone. So something good came out of it. So something good came out of it. You know, she, she as, I mean, you know, I think <laughs> I, I think in this particular show, she was the music and Mr. Jessel, I believe he was the lyricist. That's kind of how what I gathered from there. They may have worked more collaboratively, but... I'm not. It's not entirely clear. It says music and lyrics by Marion Grudeff and Raymond Jessel. So I, I actually think she wrote the music and he wrote the lyrics. They are both credited with both. Mm-hmm. And uh, knowing what he has done, mm-hmm. um, I, I, he does have a music background. He Clearly. does. Clearly, yeah. maybe he's not as strong a musician as she was, or mm-hmm. he, he wasn't as strong as she was. But uh, based on his. Uh, Later career. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll say to say here that, um, so Raymond Jessel was, he was a Welsh songwriter, screenwriter, orchestrator, and musical theater composer. Born in Cardiff, moved to Canada in 1955. Uh, that's where he met Marion Grudeff. Um, 
Uh, he did contribute to shows like the Dean Martin Show, the Carol Burnett Show, the Smothers Brothers Show, Bob Newhart Show, and lots of others. In the 1970s and 80s, he was a writer and editor for episodes of The Love Boat and Head of the Class. So, you know, he he didn't do nothing <laughs> after this, right? Mm-hmm. This was kind of in the in the middle of everything that he also that he was doing. So, yeah, after it says after he, you know, helped write songs for this, he just went on to be like a sketch comedy writer in Hollywood, which mm-hmm. is pretty fun, pretty fun for him. Um Though if you go on YouTube and look up Ray Jessel, you're gonna see you're gonna find uh something else he's probably more famous for now. <laughs> uh we don't necessarily need to get into that. Yeah, I don't really have anything nice to say have. about that performance. So <laughs> Yeah, we so just we won't talk about that, but if you want to go find it, you can go find it. Check That's it out say. uh at your own discretion. At your own discretion, right. Uh so I will say that at the time this uh to say it, the reviews for this show were mixed is pretty um, generous, <laughs> I suppose. Mm. Um, th- there is a quote here from uh, the Stereo Review magazine who said that uh, they described they described the score for Baker Street as being uh, warmed over Gilbert and Sullivan with a gilled sauce of Lerner and Lowe. So, you know, kind of what we've talked about, it definitely comes off like they were inspired by these other very prolific musical writers but maybe didn't quite have the chops to pull it off is it's kind of how it comes off to me yeah it kind of reminds me of like when you're high school or you know middle school english teacher and music teacher like yeah we could put on a musical for the school Mm -hmm. and like it's fine because you're working with children and like it's a cute play about i don't know it's a christmas pageant or whatever like Mm -hmm. When children are doing mediocre work, whatever. But I, I I just really don't understand how this made it to Broadway. Well, I mean, to be fair, you know, if, if you're going to compare this to, like, other Broadway shows, obviously this is not, like, this was competing against Fiddler on the Roof at the Tonys. Mm-hmm. There's no way this would come even close to that. But there are still worse shows than this. Well, yeah. <laughs> or shows that s- s- extremely underperformed. I mean, this show, even though, you know, we're talking about it here and, w- and we didn't love it or even really. And some of us probably, probably you didn't even like it. <laughs> but taking that into into consideration, it still ran for over 300 performances, which is more than a lot of shows do. Yeah. I, uh. I just think maybe in 1965, audiences had bad taste. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. It how Number one, how did they get Hal Prince? I know Hal Prince wasn't like Hal Prince in 1965, right? Right. This, Not yet. He wasn't, it wasn't what we think of today. But, but he directed Fiddler before this. Yeah. Did he not? Yeah. Yeah. And then came to do this. And I mean, maybe Bach and Harnett got him. I don't know. The other thing that I'm interested to know more about, and I don't know if I will ever learn more about this, is that it started at the Broadway Theater and then transferred to the Martin Beck Theater, which is now the Al Hirschfeld Theater, mm-hmm. which is an off-Broadway space. So it, it some of the 311 performances were actually off-Broadway performances, which is fine. Shows do that all the time. Yeah, but sure. it transferred at the end of October, right? It closed on Broadway, technically October 30th, reopened off Broadway November 3rd and then closed November 14th. So like mm-hmm. were we just planning to do the show for 11 more days or did it flop after it, it transferred? Cuz transferring a show is expensive. Like surely it wasn't worth it. It probably wasn't. No, I'm I'm assuming that it probably was that. But like apparently the and I don't know much about, you know, theater producers to be honest with you. But from what I can understand, um Alexander Cohen may not have made the best financial decisions as a producer I, yeah <laughs> so that's kind of i feel like that's kind of where where that comes in there i think we're looking at the same thing uh the wikipedia article yeah this makes me laugh i'm gonna just read the quote producer alexander okay. h cohen felt the show was such an event that he announced prior to the opening men would not be admitted unless they were clad in jackets and ties and women would be a- allowed in only if they wore dresses <laughs> This policy mm-hmm. quickly changed once the mixed reviews were in. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't really surprise me. And, you know, speaking of that, I actually found a, a quote here uh, or a little excerpt from a book called Open a New Window, the Broadway Musicals of the 1960s by Ethan Morden. Mm-hmm. And he had some things to say a little bit about Baker Street. And I will I'll just kind of read a little bit of this here. 
Uh, Baker Street, a musical adventure of Sherlock Holmes, suggests at first moment something better left untried. Sherlock Holmes singing, and where's the romance? But remember, it's an adventure, a rare chance to use the musical's technology on a thriller. Um, Jerome Cooper Smith drew his libretto more or less from Arthur Conan Doyle, but this really was a novelty in every respect, uh, from its Holmes and Moriarty to its giant electrified sign of crimes and progress that producer Alexander Cohen erected on the facade of the Broadway theater for all to see. Uh, and then he, he goes on to say that uh, Inga Swenson supplied some heart interest as the American actress who starts as Holmes's foe and quickly becomes his, conf- his uh, confederate. Uh, Peter Salas played the ever clueless Dr. Watson. The Bill Baird marionettes presented Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee Parade. And Oliver Smith designed an ingenious series of twisty visuals peaking in a confrontation of the, on the Dover Cliffs when both Holmes and Moriarty went flying over the edge. Hal Prince directed, Lee Becker Theodore choreographed, and Cohen spent the money. All this led to ba- all of this led to Baker Street's being a genuine, spectacular, lavish, and fast and suspenseful as a mystery must be. It did win Best Scenic Design at it the did. Tonys. So yeah, I it sure I did. was looking to see if I could find any pictures and I I couldn't see very much. It looks like uh there's some pictures of the playbill. Mm-hmm. But I, I would love to know what it looked like because maybe the visual interest. It's like anything else. You can trick people into thinking a show is good if the spectacle is there. Right. And I I'm think I'm gathering from his quote there. It was probably a pretty spectacular set. Like the production value was there. It mm-hmm. just was kind of empty other than that. And maybe it's one of these. This is one of those shows that if you want to produce this show that you just need to be able to be able to utilize that. Right. Because like like we said, even looking at this, watching this community production that we watched, the you know the ideas are there. It's just you're a community theater. It's really hard to do a lot of this very specific choreography or scenic elements that you need to make this show like really good. Yeah. Oh, Playbill's got to look back on it. Yeah, I and see that. It's mostly pictures of the performers, obviously, including mm-hmm. uh, Tommy Toon, who made his Broadway debut. Oh, look at that. Oh, Christopher Walken also made his mm-hmm. uh, Broadway his Broadway debut in the show, which is also a fun fact. Yeah, it looks like, I mean, from what we can see from the limited images here, it looks like the set was pretty elaborate. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. And uh, Fritz Weaver definitely looks the part of a Sherlock Holmes, I'll say that. Yeah. And Inga Svensson, being, uh, being as beautiful as she is, obviously makes a very good Irene, Sad- uh, Irene Adler, even though, like, that's not, nece- not a necessary thing for her, but... It is part of her allure is that she's very attractive. Right. Yeah. Sorry. You, you, as you were getting the words out, I heard Irene Sadler, and that was the one we saw. <laughs> Burn. Uh. Anyway, I did say that. I did misspeak, yes. But anyway, um, there is a little bit of a kind of a, a little bit of a final quote here from the uh, the book that I quoted earlier, the open a new window, the Broadway musical of the 1960s. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is what Ethan Morden says kind of in this last little stanza about Baker Street. In terms of its songs, this is no Camelot. Cohen entrusted the score to the unknown, Marion Grudeff and Raymond Jessel, and they produced an unknown score. It's not terrible, exactly. Inga Swenson inspired them. Her numbers are valid. An ensemble number with the good guys and setting off in disguise, what a night this is going to be, is lively. The first number a setting of the famous Holmesian deductive process, it's so simple, is correct. It was really generous to compare it to Camelot, which I also find boring. Yeah, right. Camelot is boring. Sorry if you're a Camelot stan Sweet. out there. If you're a Camelot stan. What are you doing here? Send me <laughs> send me an email, thegreatestshowpodcast at gmail.com, and let's talk, because I think you probably need help. <laughs> I mean, no offense to uh, anyone that's been in that production recently. Because it was up for, you know, the revival was up for some Tonys. But, man, that show's boring. <laughs> so boring. If you're a fan of that show, why? Yeah. If you want to come on here and defend it, or at least talk to us to defend it on social media, add us, send us emails, whatever you got to do. Like, I'd love to know about it. <laughs> I mean, honestly, we'll probably eventually talk about Camelot, but I'm not looking super looking forward to it. No. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Okay, now we get to the point in the show. Let's give it. Let's rate this show. What do you give the show out of out of ten? Two. A two. 
I was gonna be a little more generous. I was gonna say four. Oh well, uh, you're very ni- you're nicer than I am. That's also true. I'd give, but I give it a four because it does have moments that I think have a lot of potential. It's just as a whole pretty flat in one note. Mm. And it's definitely not the worst thing I've ever seen. Like, I've seen some pretty bad stuff. I think Repo the Genetic Opera is worse than this. But that's probably me. And I'm probably going to get in trouble for that. Because I know that's a, that's got a cult following. And maybe eventually we'll talk about Repo as well. But, like, I mean, I enjoyed this more than I enjoyed Repo, probably. Interesting. Yeah, I maybe it's in a three. Maybe it's like a two and a half. Because I don't. I dislike this a lot. I don't hate right. it. Right. It's just bad. And it's not maliciously bad it just feels like a bunch of people who who liked musical theater and also liked Sherlock Holmes and wanted to write a thing yeah and so they did Mm -hmm. and like good for you I guess but like that doesn't mean it's good no and that's okay (laughs) you know I mean this probably could have used several passes or a complete pass (laughs) as far as like just not do it um but you know like there's there's shows that you and I've worked on where I've felt um like it's got potential and it's getting there, but it needs either someone else to kind of look at it or it needs, you know, maybe to like shift some perspective or something mm. to just make it a, to just elevate it a little bit more. And I just think that while this show did, I think it did get that when they brought in Harnick and Bach, they probably brought them in to try to make it a little bit better. And so if that's the case, it makes me wonder what was it like before? Right. Mm. I mean, if two of the songs still use the word derriere, <laughs> two different songs in the same show use the same rhyme scheme, then I'm just kind of, it makes me wonder what, uh, like, if there were other songs, if they were cut, you know, or if, like, how, like, we kind of have an idea of how much Harnick and Bach actually contributed to the show, because it's documented, right? They wrote um, at least four songs. Mm-hmm. But did they rework anything else? We don't really know. Yeah. And do you think that there's a cast that could actually make this a pretty decent show to watch? I think it needs some serious edits for it to work, at least for a modern audience. I still mm-hmm. don't think I'd buy Sherlock as a singing character. Mm-hmm. I think if we took that frame and made it either Moriarty is like the narrator and it's told from his perspective, or maybe it's told from Watson's perspective... Because isn't, yeah. isn't most of Sherlock literature from Watson's perspective? Question mark. Am I am I misremembering that? Isn't most aren't most of the books from Watson's perspective? Um, I believe that they are. Yeah. So that I, does I mean, sound right. there there's a like existing support for that. Like if everyone else is a singing character and not Sherlock. I mean, that's what I was going to suggest. Is like, do what do we need to make? Would you make? everyone else sing around him but he doesn't sing in the very beginning so that first number Mm -hmm. is it's all so simple right yeah have sherlock figure it out and then just have watson sing the song to explain it to everybody else yeah it's so simple so very simple yeah and then and then he's just sitting there talking about it but i mean it kind of i mean it 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 kind of is like that a a smidge because watson does sing some of the things and Mm -hmm. then the guy who's uh being deduced from that he also is uh singing parts of it as well mm-hmm. so it's kind of like that but if the entire show was like that i think it would work a little maybe maybe, maybe it would work a little bit better if sherlock is not the one that's singing unless you are writing him lyrically above and beyond everyone else mm-hmm. and i don't i don't know who's capable of fixing that mm-hmm. like sondheim's gone right if we put Lynn Manuel Miranda on it, it's gonna be a wrap. Yeah. <laughs> I don't necessarily want to see Sherlock Holmes rap. Right. I don't um, I don't think that works though. I just I just don't buy him as a singing character. Yeah. And that's fine. Like I mean, and the actually for for me in my head sets up a little bit more comedy because it's like they all go to him and he's like, I don't sing and then just kinda move on. Right? <laughs> it's like Yeah. No. <laughs> Or I mean, you could even you could even play with that thought, where like Watson singing and, and then Watson singing to explain the thing, and you know the audience is set up that uh, this is non diegetic, and mm-hmm. that it's the, you know the songs for the audience and not for the characters, and then have Sherlock like make a comment about why why is everyone singing? Yeah, <laughs> like why is everyone singing? I don't understand. Yeah, like something like that, yeah. 
if yeah. you if you want to inject more comedy i just yeah i don't buy it so mm-hmm. i think if you could make changes to make it better i don't know that i would like it anyway mm-hmm. i don't know it's a no for me dog okay no, that's fair <laughs> you know we don't have to like everything i think this i think like i said it has potential but where you could find it i don't know as far as like what you could fix i just think it needs another pass it needs another it needs some more work mm-hmm. and I, when i think if you have really charismatic talented performers it, you can forgive it could work really well yeah and and maybe that's what they got as well i mean obviously inga svensson was very good mm-hmm. i mean she was nominated for a tony so obviously she was a standout in this particular cast um but i think maybe simplifying the story would help you know yeah Instead of having three, have two, or even just do one. If you really want to have Irene Adler in the show, then make sure you can do part of a story that she's in. But Moriarty needs to have more of a presence. Yeah, it feels like it's trying to do too much as a fan Mm -hmm. service. Mm -hmm. Instead of just, like, you can, if you really want to do that, I'm sure there's ways to work passing references in. Yeah, for sure. But... And they kind of did to an extent, too, where she's like, oh, you have a fang from a Baskerville hound or something uh like that. It's part of the part of the dialogue there there's stuff there it's just how do you it, it's just got to be utilized i think just a little bit better mm-hmm. and it would make it a, a, a little bit of a better show but i don't see this becoming a revival anytime soon no yeah i think <laughs> there's a reason it's largely forgotten yeah yeah unfortunately but that's also you know a lot of things um with a lot of musicals like not every musical is going to be as popular as hamilton or phantom of the opera nothing's really gonna you know not everything is going to blow up like that, mm-hmm. and that's fine. Yeah. Woo, that was one of our shortest <laughs> sessions talking about the show. I'm going to have that stupid simple song stuck in my head. It's so simple, so very simple. But it shouldn't be. It should be very complicated. It should take more than a two-minute song for me to know what the <laughs> f*** you're talking about, Sherlock, <laughs> if you're so smart. It's the Greatest Show, man. It's produced by Brantley Wheeler and Emily Chavon. Our theme song is by the incredibly talented Patrick Duffy. Links to all his social media in the episode description. You can find us on all the socials at Greatest Show Pod. Tweet at Emily and tell her why her opinions are bad and she should feel bad. If you have any suggestions for a musical we should cover in the future, send us an email at thegreatestshowpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you on the next one. What I'm hearing is that when we write a musical someday, I need to work Derriere into every song. <laughs> Only if it's the first one we've talked about. <laughs> no. Yes. For when we do Head of Gobbler the musical, I'm going to write <laughs> Yes. Absolutely. We'll do it then. <laughs> and it's a rock musical too, so. <laughs>